Scott and Montgomery College for inviting me to the Spectrum Lecture Series. It's nice to be here talking to you, all of you. And um, as, as he said, I work at NASA, but specifically I work at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, which is over in Greenbelt, Maryland. Um, can people raise their hand if they've either been there or been by there or know about it at all? Okay, good. A, a good number of people. That's great. Um, NASA Goddard is actually the largest collection of research scientists anywhere in the world on a single campus. Um, and it's right here outside of DC. And I'd really encourage you, if you get a chance, to visit the Visitor Center or um, take other opportunities to come on campus and see what, uh, what we're doing at Goddard, because it's a pretty exciting, dynamic place both to work and to visit. Um, and it's right in your backyard. And you can get a, a great you know, fire hose of experience about what NASA is doing there. So, uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about our efforts um, around exoplanet environments and our research in that regard. Um, I'm going to first give you a, an overview of, you know, of what an exoplanet is, um, where we are in the field of exoplanets, and uh, where we're going. And then I'm going to end with where we're going in the next couple decades, both in the next couple years and in the next couple decades uh, with our work at NASA in this regard. Um, the first thing I like to show, uh, obviously, when I give a talk is this, which looks like a picture that you all are familiar with, a ho-hum picture, you know, stars and trees, and maybe this is a house over here. This is a picture you would see looking up outside of your house, walking outside um, at night. Obviously, here in, in Metro DC, you probably see you know, a tenth of the number of stars that you would see in this, you see in this picture. But you can imagine walking outside and looking up um, and seeing the huge number of stars arrayed out uh, above you in the sky. Um, and, and, and what motivates me, and hopefully what should, what should be, you know, spark the imagination of all of you, is thinking that every single one of these stars, on average, every star that you see has at least one planet orbiting that star, on average. There are the same number of planets as there are stars in our galaxy, on average. And so every one of these stars could host a planet. And one out of 10 of those stars could host a planet like Earth around it. So if you imagine looking at every single one, imagine that one-tenth of these stars may have a living planet orbiting the star. And that's, that's really exciting. Um, and it really sort of pushes us to think about these huge questions about our own planet and our own solar system. How did our solar system form? And are our planetary characteristics of Earth and the other planets in our solar system, are they usual, unusual? Is this how all planetary systems look? And of course, as I said, are there other worlds like Earth? We know there are planets. We know there are planets in the range of what we call the Goldilocks zone, um, similar to Earth, which I'll explain more about in the, in the talk. But that doesn't mean that those planets look like ours. That doesn't mean that they have oceans and continents and, and life flourishing, as you can see from this picture. You look up and see life everywhere. Do these other planets also have this amount of life? And of course, this should really make you think from a cultural and societal perspective, and, and really a philosophical one. What does it mean to discover a planet or planets near around nearby stars that do have signs of life, and possibly even signs of intelligent life? What does this mean for our perspective on our planet and life on Earth and, and the, the, you know, the, our place in the universe? And so I like to you know, add this quote at the end, you know, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. This was Carl Sagan, one of the, the pioneers of really opening our minds about how groundbreaking and philosophically earth shattering this would be to consider you know, intelligent life on another planet. And so we're only in the initial stages and the first steps of understanding planets around other stars. But even these first steps, as I'll describe today, are, are really amazing and exciting um, and really bode well for what will come next. So, you know, again, just to start at the beginning, where you always want to start, is the basic, you know, methodology, the basic groundwork for how do we study planets around nearby stars. First, let me start even before that and talk about the word exoplanets. It's, uh, uh, you know, uh, combination of two words, extrasolar planet. Extrasolar means outside of 
our own solar system, similar to extracurricular, right? So you'll see extrasolar planets or exoplanets um, basically as a class of objects around other stars that may or may not be similar to the planets in our own solar system, uh, but do orbit another star. And that's the key aspect here. We discover them primarily, there are you know, sort of flukes um, outside of these four methodologies, but these are the four methods we use to discover planets in general, exoplanets around other stars. The first one here is called precision radial velocity. And the idea is, if you see this on the bottom, this is a spectrum. If you've been, who's been in a physics class and actually seen a spectrum before from, a, uh, from a, a light source? Okay, a few people. But what happens is if you put a prism, even if you take a, a magnifying glass outside or sometimes see something through a window, you'll see a rainbow created as white light comes through. That's what happens when you get the light from the star um, filtered through a prism. And as the planet tugs on this star, the star moves back and forth. This is called the Doppler effect. And again, I'll leave it to your physics professors to explain this more, but it shifts the light back and forth as the star moves. And so we don't see the planet in this picture you do, but all we see is the star moving in a circle and the spectrum of light, the light spread out into its colors by a prism shifting back and forth. And so I won't go into all the details beyond that, but this, doesn't, this method doesn't see the planet at all. We don't see the planet, we just see the star. This method over here, which we call the transit method, this works by having the planet cross in front of its parent star. And so the, the planet blocks out the light from the star. It actually forms a little black disk in front of the star. Again, I, I wish the video worked, but you see the brightness of the star dip over time and then come back up. It's almost like a street light or a spotlight, in fact, dims and then comes back. So it dims and comes back, dims and com comes back as the planet orbits over and over and over again. This is called the transit method. It's transiting in front. And this is a great method because you see the planet itself. Well, you don't see the planet, but you see the shadow of the planet on the star, right? It's the shadow method. So you see it and you can actually determine the size the actual area of that planet blocking out the star. But, and you can look at many, many stars at once and see all of them blinking on and off as the planets come in front of that star. So it's great to detect many, many planets at once. These other two methods, astrometry and direct imaging, haven't been so successful in discovering planets, but this one in particular, direct imaging, I, I'll, I'm gonna move on from astrometry right now. I can answer questions at the end, but direct imaging is really the, gold, the golden ticket to discovering planets because you're actually taking a real picture. Instead of just seeing you know, a hidden planet or, around the moving star or a shadow of a planet over the star, you actually get the light from the planet itself. And you can stare at this planet for as long as you want to collect more and more and more information. You can see it move around its star and its whole orbit. You can, you can see it change in brightness based on continents shifting into view as the planet rotates. So you can learn a, a huge amount from a picture. A picture is worth a thousand transits of a, of, a, of a planet is what we like to say, or a thousand words. So this is the, this is the, the, the key to the future to the observations of planets, but we're not quite there yet at this point. So I'll spend most of my time talking about what we've discovered from these methods here. Let's, oh, there we go. Okay, so this is what we knew about exoplanets in 1989. We knew of one planet around another star, and in fact, we didn't even know that this was a planet. We actually thought that this might be a sort of failed, you know, mini star orbiting its parent star. We call those brown dwarfs. We thought that this planet, you know, probably wasn't another planet because it orbited so close to its star. I'm gonna explain here what this is. We have the orbital period of planets here on the bottom and ours, Earth is at 365, right? We have a, a one year orbital period around its star. So these planets in here are closer to their star. They have a shorter period. And these planets are farther from their star. They move slower around their, planet, around their star because they're farther out. And this is the planet's radius. So this planet 
was actually inside the orbit of Earth, but it was 40 times the radius of Earth. So it was like having a super Jupiter orbiting where Venus is in our system. And to us, that seemed mind-blowing, right? I mean, how could you have this giant, giant planet very close or relatively close to a star where it would be heated up? This was, this was quite unexpected, and therefore, the people who published it were very reluctant to extrapolate. But over the next 20 years, by 2009, we now knew of many, many planets around nearby stars. This was on the, something on the order of 1,000 planets around nearby stars in 2009. And they ranged all the way from almost Earth radius, almost the size of Earth, but very, very close to the star. Look, they're whipping around their stars in one to 10 days, you know, rapidly moving, almost close to the outer boundary of the star itself, to giant planets more distant, thousands to tens, 10,000 orbital period, days orbital periods. So the range of planets was huge in 2009. But you can already start to see trends occurring, right? There's this cluster of pink uh, planets here. These are the ones discovered by the transit method, while these blue ones are discovered by the radial velocity method. And so the transit method finds planets very close to their star and, and large because they're blocking out the light of the star in a huge amount in interior, and they're very close, they're whipping around, while radio velocity is able to find planets across the range of orbital periods, but it starts to see a clumping here at around 500 to 1,000 days orbital period, basically one to two astronomical units where our, our Earth sits in this position. So you're starting to see trends. The interesting thing was in 2009, a new telescope was launched to find planets around 150,000 stars at once using the transit method. This was called the Kepler telescope. And this is what only a couple years later, the, the planet population looked like. Uh, this is what roughly we know today of the exoplanet population around nearby stars. Thousands, we're up to almost 4,500 planets, 4,500 planets. And really there, as I said, there's a, essentially a planet around every star on average in the galaxy. This is only a sampling of planets um, around in a pinpoint, in a pencil beam, looking away from our, our own solar system. But you can see that these trends, these trends up here of large planets, really are only the tip of the iceberg. That small planets, this is a four, one to four times the radius of the Earth. This is basically Earth to Neptune, if you know about Neptune and Uranus, our own solar system. Almost all the planets are this size. They're actually small planets. And we're not even probing planets like Earth at 365 days and one Earth radius. We didn't even get there because the, the, the telescope, unfortunately, had a malfunction at, at, at it in its fifth year of life and was not able to truly probe this region because longer periods require a longer period of observation. But we don't even know all the planets in the small planet range yet. Um, and so there's a, a still a whole air range of planets that we have yet to detect. But if you just look at the planets we do know of, the Neptunes and what we call super Earths, which is one to two Earth radii, these planets dominate the planet population. And these, the actual Earth-like planets, may be even more ubiquitous than the super-Earths, depending on what we find uh, moving forward for new discoveries. And Neptu large Neptunes and gas giants are quite rare. Um, so as we have in our own solar system, many more smaller planets, that's what we see in other solar systems. The unusual thing is that if you go back to this plot, they're all within the orbit of Earth at this point, of all the planets we know of. So we're really seeing Neptunes, like our whole solar system packed down into a very, very small region of the, solar, of the planetary um, orbital space that we see so far. So this was incredibly surprising to astronomers to find all these planets, large planets and small planets, sitting very close to their stars. And it's really revolutionized our study of planetary systems because we can examine planets that are hot and cold, large and small. I mean, it, the parameter space of, of, of possibilities for planetary atmospheres and their surfaces is blown wide open. 
So, um, so I just want to show this plot. Uh, I'm going to explain it um, very briefly. But the, the key thing is that by looking at transiting planets only, you can get both the mass of the planet through the radial velocity of the star, because that, that measures the mass of a, of a planet, and the radius, which gives you the density, right? Mass over volume, and volume is essentially related to radius. So mass over volume gives you the density of a planet. And if you think about it, density really tells you the materials that something is made of. A balloon has a very low density, and it's mostly made of air with a little bit of you know, covering on it, while a rock or a you know, rebar piece of metal or anything else is very high density because it's made of metals or rocks. And everything in between, water. Water has a medium density of between rock and air. And so by mapping out the density of planets versus mass, you can start to find categories of materials, um, whether they are dominated by a large, thick atmosphere, as these giant planets would be, and even into the stellar range. These are the giant planets which their density increases with size because their gravity pulls in their giant atmosphere. As they get larger and larger above about a Jupiter mass, these planets get denser and denser as they move to the stellar boundary here at around 100 Jupiter masses. But below a Jupiter mass, you get a huge range in density. And that's because some planets have large puffy atmospheres and some like these below the at the bottom have no atmosphere at all uh, sorry at the top density goes higher density is a is a rockier more metal rich in interior and low density below one is all gas and so most of these planets are dense even you know denser almost pure iron possibly in their cores while some of them have poofy um, very low density atmospheres. And so we hope in the, we think that this region in the future will provide a huge diversity of planetary properties going forward. So um, what will we find in these planets? As I said, Neptunes, which are um, quite common, we think have a core of ice with a, a, a rocky core with a, a large ice mantle around them. So their density is something on the order of 1.5 to 2 grams per centimeter cubed. If you go back to this plot again, this would be in this region right here. So all of these planets probably look something like Neptune. While Earth, which has mostly a silicate mantle and an and a iron metal core, will be in the 6 grams per centimeter cubed. So it has a small crust almost no atmosphere. This, the, our atmosphere on Earth is like the skin of an apple around the planet. So our atmosphere is essentially negligible when taking into account what the overall density of the planet is. So these planets would fit in around here. The silicate planets would be in this range right here. And these would be the iron planets. The fascinating thing is, what about super-Earths? What about these planets in between Earths and Neptunes? Would they have something like a huge global liquid ocean around it? Because you'd get all of these volatile elements, waters and other things like this, all surfacing above the silicates and, and the metals. So you would get a large volatile content of either water or you know, icy carbon dioxide or other things like this, depending on where the planet sits in its orbit, all on the outside of the planet, like we have for the moons of Jupiter where we have Europa and Enceladus, some of these more fascinating um, satellites in our outer solar system? Or will you get really something that just looks like Neptune scaled down with a thick atmosphere around them and, and maybe a dense ice mantle underneath? We don't really know. This is what we hope to discover uh, moving forward. So uh, the other thing we, we really want to know about these planets is how did they form? Where did they come from? Um, what are they, that will tell us what they're made of, what their evolutionary history is. Understanding how the composition for, relates to the origin, the birthplace of these planets, will tell us about their history and, and hopefully the history of other planets in the system that may be Earth-like or, or potentially inhabited. So this is a general picture of what we know about the birthplaces of planets right now. This is what we call a protoplanetary disk. And you have the star, the protostar in the center. 
the planet formation region is here in the middle. And then you have this huge, puffy, dusty outer disk um, in the outer regions, which puffs up due to the radiation from the star and the surrounding stars. But this region continually feeds gas and dust into the planet forming region. And, and here, what you start to get is these what are called condensation fronts. So inside of this, the temperature is too warm for water to be ice. So you get a water vapor permeating the, all of the gas and dust inside of this region. And so all the planets formed inside of this ice line will all be ice poor, but their atmospheres will have a huge amount of water in them. While planets formed outside this line will have a huge amount of CO2 and H2, will have a huge amount of H2O ice, but no CO2 ice. So planets will be H2O rich, but CO2 poor. And so if you imagine planets forming in different parts of this nebula, they will have different compositions, which will lead to very different chemistries and geophysics geologies about these planets. So understanding how planets form and what they're made of will tell us a lot about the history and evolution of planetary systems. You can also have planets formed very, very close to their star where there's no real volatile elements at all. What will these planets look like? Will they be completely devoid of, of all water and CO2 and everything? Or will they be, have these thick atmospheres? We don't really know. Um, we need to understand much more about the atmospheres and populations of these planets. So summarizing at the midpoint of my lecture here, what are our burning questions about all of these different planet properties? What do we really want to know going forward? These are the key questions that we've laid out for the community, uh, the research community in exoplanets. First, Jupiters. They seem kind of boring, right? Just big gas balls, but they are really the signposts of and the, you know, the bullies of a planetary system. If they come through and they form within your system, they will completely wreck any planets around them. We want to understand where they form and do they migrate? Do they move within, their, within the system? Uh, we think Jupiter in our own system may have moved back and forth during formation and caused the asteroid belt to remain as a pile of rubble rather than a planet itself. The asteroid belt should have been another planet in our system. Jupiter caused it to, uh, to, to remain deconstructed in that sense. Neptune, super-Earths, what are they? Neptunes are Earths. And why do they form the way they form? Um, do, they, do they depend sensitively on where they form in the, in the nebula? And how do they form and their structure? But of course, the really, you know, the, the jackpot of exoplanet studies are the Earth-like planets. What's the diversity of the planetary properties? What do they look like on their surfaces, their atmospheres? How do they form over time? What's their evolution? And of course, which ones are habitable or even inhabited? So I can't answer these questions for you. If, you, if anyone would like to leave now, that's uh, understandable. But what I can tell you is that we are making quick progress, especially on the large planets. Um, and the next generation of NASA missions will really break open the study of these larger planets and hopefully help us really start to understand the populations of these smaller and really fascinating uh, terrestrial rocky planets. So first I wanted to explain how we understand the atmospheres of these planets. If you can see, the atmosphere really sort of cause, leads to a huge amount of the diversity of these planets um, what, and what we can see from observations from the outside. The atm atmospheres for gas giants really form the core, uh, the, the bulk of, of these planets' um, mass and radius. And for small planets, you, the atmosphere is a skin, but it, it, it's a, a critical component of the, of the planet's um, uh, composition. So exoplanet transit spectroscopy is the tool that today and in the near future we use to probe the atmospheres of these planets. I'm going to focus on this diagram here. You can see as a planet transits in front of its star, as I said, the light dips like this. But if you have a spectrum, if you break your, your light up, 
you will see absorption from things like methane and water in the spectrum of the planet. And the light in, that is absorbed by water, the transit will appear deeper than it would in regions which are not absorbed by water. And so what you'll end up with is building up a picture of a huge absorbing region of water um, around the planet and the smaller regions of other molecules and a solid core where nothing is absorbing, um, which demonstrates where the solid surface of a planet might be or the optical depth uh, approaching unity, one or the other. Um, but the key is that you can really probe different molecular constituents of an atmosphere just by watching that planet's atmosphere, that planet's spectrum, excuse me, as the planet crosses in front of the star. And so we've already been able to do this. You can hear, see here on the upper left, this is a spectrum. So this is wavelength in the infrared. So you're breaking the light up in the, into the infrared uh, colors here. And this dip, this is the light. This is the intensity of light rising to the infrared because planets are hot and they rise in, in emission intensity as they go into the infrared. If there's a dip, Right here, that means something is absorbing. Something in the atmosphere of the planet is absorbing water, uh, absorbing light from the central star. And this is a water band, a uh, very clear indication of water absorption in the atmosphere of, planet, of the planet. What you can do is you can really wildly extrapolate from something like this, a detection of one molecule, to the amount of total elements in the planet's atmosphere. Um, and WASP-43 is really the, the first planet that we were able to really constrain what the overall amount of heavy stuff in that atmosphere was. The reason this is important is because Neptune and Uranus and even Earth, which is, isn't even on this plot because it's down over here, have many more heavy elements. They're just a, a lot heavier, a lot denser, as I said earlier in the talk, while Saturn and Jupiter are very puffy and light. Um, because they're full of hydrogen and helium gases. WASP-43 is very similar to Jupiter. Um, it has a large uncertainty level here, but we finally are able to find a planet and actually conclusively determine that it's quite similar to another planet in our own solar system. Rather than just a pinprick or a shadow of light on its star, we were able to actually determine the heavy element composition of its atmosphere and place it in relation to our other planets. So this is the beginning of comparative planetology, comparing like us, not like us. You know, does it, does it have uh, the constituents needed for life or, or not? We can start to get to those, those regions. So the interesting thing is, after this planet, we've been able to, to push this even more. Um, and what, but what we find is that planets actually look quite different than the planets in our own solar system. WASP-43, lies right on this line, but HAP P26, another planet actually in the Neptune and Uranus range, seems to be very similar to a Jupiter mass planet in its metallicity. It's down at around the same metallicity as the star itself, while HAP P11, also a Neptune mass planet, seems to have a very high metallicity. And so really we end up with more questions right now than we have answers. It's a, it's a frustrating experience sometimes in research that you think you're finding something that you know, conforms to your expectations of what planetary systems should look like, and immediately your theories get blown out of the water by new data. So what we, uh, and then on top of that, the more planets we start to find, they completely lie away from this line, this trend altogether. And so rather than getting a nice pretty picture, we have a new, possibly brand new populations of, me, of, of planetary properties that we didn't expect at all. And so what we really need to do is start to fill up this plot, similar to those other plots I showed you of planets across the spectrum and understand what they uh, look like and what they're made of. The other fascinating thing is that we start to be able to probe the atmosphere's structure, the structure of atmospheres of planets. In our own solar system, in our own Actually, on, our, on Earth itself, we have something called the stratosphere. Who, can you raise your hand if you've heard of a stratosphere before? OK, everyone's heard of the stratosphere, or most people. That's excellent. Can, uh, I, well, I won't ask a question because of the forum, but the stratosphere is really, really important on Earth for us, right? The stratosphere is 
the thing that protects us from the UV, harmful UV rays from our own sun. And that's because the stratosphere is formed by ozone, which absorbs UV radiation. What that absorption does is it heats up the atmosphere and you get this huge increase in temperature in the stratosphere compared to this is what would be the troposphere in our own planet. Without a stratosphere, all the UV would come through and you'd get a clean, smooth, um, non-gradiated uh, atmospheric structure. Uh, the thing is that this plot from 2012 really tries to lay out what molecules could be absorbing like ozone in different types of planets. Um, the, this, these TIO VO here, this gray zone, is really the only region where we should see stratospheres on other planets. And the reason is, um, on, on other gas rich planets, and the reason is that these have a similar structure to sunscreen in our own, um, that we use every day on our, on our skin. Can anyone tell me the chemical structure of sunscreen? You sometimes see it, anyone looked on the back? No? It's actually zinc oxide. Has anyone heard, the, heard of that? Zinc oxide? How much zinc oxide? Or what's that white stuff on your nose? It's zinc oxide. That's what sunscreen is. It's a, a zinc, Z, it would be zinc and then an, an oxygen atom tagged on to the end. Very similar to titanium oxide or vanadium oxide. So these elements all absorb in the UV and optical and re-radiate heating up the atmosphere. We already think we see this in several gas giant planets that we're studying. Um, this is a, a planet called WASP-33, which we study uh, the, the emission coming from the planet. W the spectrum of the planet suggests that the atmosphere, which is in red here, is hot, has a hot stratosphere, and is emitting from the top of the atmosphere um, in, a, in a very extreme, uh, version of this phenomenon. It's going all the way up to 3,500 Kelvin. So that's something like 7,000 degrees, the upper atmosphere, while the bottom of the atmosphere is still hot, but it's below 3,000 Kelvin. And so we see a huge increase in temperature, indicating that the chemistry sits somewhere in this range um, of, of stellar flux and composition. This is carbon to oxygen ratio. So how many carbon atoms to oxygen atoms you have. But the weird thing is you would expect some planets to sit in this region with no stratosphere at all because you don't have any of these elements if you have too many carbon atoms because they're combining to create carbon monoxide primarily in this atmosphere. So by exploring which planets have a stratosphere, Here's another one which shows a huge extreme stratospheric effect, uh, but almost no water. The, the interesting thing is you can start to map out which planets have a stratosphere, which are these green dots right here. They show an inverted temperature profile, which shows a heating of the upper atmosphere, versus planets which don't. No spectral features, no inversion in blue here. And so you can start to understand what types of chemistries are driving the temperature profile of these planets. Again, it's only the very initial understanding of planetary atmospheres, but it starts to give us a picture that we've never had before of planets around other stars. I'm going to skip this slide. Um, I can come back to it, but we're actually even exploring rocky planets very close to their star and looking for variability due to uh, atmospheric effects. Um, due to volcanoes and other types of effects. So this is very early. It's, uh, it's, it's, you know, I think to be seen in the future what this brings. But the real revolution begins with the James Webb Space Telescope, which will be launched in October of next year. Unfortunately, this looks like it may be already delayed um, to March of the following year, 2019. But all of us in the community have been waiting eagerly uh, for this telescope. You can see a somewhat of a fuzzy picture over here on the left. I don't know why that came out that way. But this telescope will have a, a, fa a segmented architecture. Um, so unlike the Hubble, unlike all telescopes in space, which have a solid mirror, this one will be a collection of segments, hexagonal segments, all put together to create uh, essentially a mirror the size of a swimming pool, essentially in space, three times larger than the Hubble Space Telescope. And it will probe the infrared wavelengths where all of these molecules 
are, are absorbing. I told you about absorption of, of light from the star. This shape right here is emission from a, of a planet. H2O, CH4, CO, all of these different molecules all absorb in regions where the James Webb Space Telescope can, all, can examine all of them. So rather than looking back at this one molecular feature or two molecular features in the planet's atmosphere, right? This was a fascinating discovery only back in 2014. In 2019, we should be able to examine all of these molecules, not just water or TIO, but every single molecule you see on this plot should have an absorption feature um, available to the James Webb Space Telescope. And so um, James Webb should revolutionize our understanding of transiting planets um, in the coming decades. So the fascinating thing, though, if you go back to this plot here of planets around other stars, is you see this gap at large distances right here, right? Transiting and radio velocity uh, discoveries cannot probe planets out here. This is like those old uh, maps you, you used to, we used to make back in the early uh, Middle Ages where you would see you know, nothing beyond a certain region. This is what we have right now in the study of exoplanets. We know almost nothing about planets at large distances and in particular planets like, like Earth. So how do we study these planets? This is the direct imaging method I talked to you about. This is the future of exoplanet studies, and this is what we're working on right now at NASA for the next phase of, of missions. So what you do, the problem is that you have this star incredibly bright with a planet incredibly dim nearby. This is the spotlight effect, having a little firefly next to you know, a lighthouse light or a spotlight. You can't see the planet's light around the star. You have to get to the point where you can remove the light from the central star completely. And what this uh, process is called is coronography, or uh, basically this originally started by, was developed to study the sun's corona, the, the incredibly diffuse light coming from the upper atmosphere of the sun. So what it is, is blocking out the central star with a disk, a black disk, and allowing you to see the light from the planet. The problem is planets around other stars are billions of times fainter than their stars. So you have to remove this light to one photon in a billion. A billion points of light you have to remove to even see one point of light from the planet itself. And then what you can do is break this into a collection of colors and build up a spectrum like what I told you before, where you have the wavelength or color of light on the bottom here and the planet flux or brightness here. And you can immediately see that the water bands, these are water bands in an Earth-like planet. This is a Earth-like planetary spectrum. The water bands will be incredibly deep in a spectrum like this because you're looking down into the atmosphere of a planet. So the water and other molecules will show up you know, in immediately as you see the spectrum of this, of this planet. And so this is, this, and you can stare at these types of planets for hours and days and even years if you want to, to gather all of the, the photons that you need to from a, um, a planet like this. So, what these will be able to finally probe is what we call the Goldilocks zone, or the habitable zone of, its, of a parent star. So what this means is you really want to focus on planets that may have liquid water on their surface. This is what a habitable planet really means to us, is a planet that has the potential to have liquid water. Why is that important? The real uh, source, or the, the whole, you know, essentially beginning and driving of life on Earth is the water that we have on our surface. Origins of life theories all begin either in small pools of water or in the depths of the ocean. And water is essential for every life form we have on Earth. And so finding a planet where liquid water is uh, possible on its surface is the first principle of finding habitable planets around other stars. 
This zone where water would be uh, stable on the surface moves out for hotter stars and moves in for cooler stars um, as the temperature goes down for a cooler star on, on different planets. And so for M star, for red stars, red dwarfs, we like to call them, we can see these planets moving in 20 days around their, their stars. That's the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone for a small star. While for us, as I said before, it's around the same orbit as Earth. So looking at how life and the surfaces of these planets would change depending on what type of star they orbit is one of the key questions we have to answer in the coming years. So um, this, oh, this is, this is a plot of all of the planets we know of today which lie close to their Goldilocks zone. You can see for small planets, um, in terms of, this is in terms of stellar flux, so you don't see the difference in distance. But for small planets, we actually know of more Goldilocks planets because they're easier to find. They're closer to their parent star and their transits are much more likely. For large stars, we know of almost no planets um, within this Goldilocks zone. But you can still see there's only a few. And these, these pretty pictures, these colorful surfaces that you might see in news reports, they're complete fiction. We know of absolutely no qualities about these planets beyond their size and their distance from their star. Because we can't yet probe down with a, a picture of the planet to understand what the atmosphere looks like. And they're too small for the transit method. So they're going to have to wait for future telescopes. No, that's not. So what will they look like? Goddard um, the, and the Exoplanet Environments Collaboration at NASA are really trying to understand what we might expect from the atmospheres of these planets. We're looking back in time of our own Earth to try to understand what our own Earth might have looked like at different times. Because we see a snapshot of what Earth looks like today. But Earth looked dramatically different at different times. The hazy Archean Earth, the Archean period was three billion years ago to, to the two billion years ago, this period of Earth's history, Earth was incredibly hazy because we had a huge amount of hydrocarbons in our atmosphere because oxygen had not yet been developed by Earth-bound plants. Plants create oxygen, and oxygen dramatically changes the structure of Earth's atmosphere. So going to a pre-oxygen atmosphere dominated by hydrocarbons gives us an incredibly different spectrum uh, for the planet. And you can see, depending on how much haze you have, again, this is breaking the light down into its different colors, you get a very different brightness um, of the spectrum, changing with, with, with uh, wavelength of the light. So by understanding this, we can predict, better predict the types of observations we might get and better prepare our telescopes. The other thing we can do is essentially conduct the exact same studies on other types of planets, uh, climate evolution that we are now conducting on ours. We're actually currently conducting a real-time experiment on climate evolution on Earth by pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But with the only reason we know what these uh, effects will be on our own atmosphere is through what we call global circulation models. These are three-dimensional, complex three-dimensional models which tell us what the overall temperature and composition of a planet would be with real continental structure in it. That's how we can predict you know, where the Earth will be warming, where dry spells will happen. And we can do the same for other planets. This is a, a model of what Venus might have looked like two billion years ago when the sun itself was dimmer and Venus may still have had water on its surface at that time. I know it's incredible to, to think about Venus, which today has a t surface temperature of 700 degrees Kelvin. It's in no way hospitable to any type of surface life. But two billion years ago, this may have been a habitable planet. And we can use models, uh, 3D models, to understand what the surface temperature may have looked like at that time, and pinpoint areas in Venus which we might want to go with future missions to actually search for uh, for the signs of life, either below the surface or above it. So, uh, oh yes, and this question of planets around other stars, we're taking these same models and applying them to planets that we already know of around other stars. Proxima Centauri b is the closest extrasolar planet 
to Earth, and it's actually a Earth-sized planet in the Goldilocks zone of its parent star. However, Proxima Centauri b does not transit, and we do not have a telescope able to take a picture, and so we know nothing about Proxima Centauri b except the distance to its star, um, and therefore its temperature and its rough radius um, from its mass, sorry, its rough mass. So what we can do, though, is start to apply our our 3D GCM models, very similar to what we can do for planets in our own solar system, to a planet around another star. And we see this fascinating effect called the eyeball Earth um, effect, where one side of the planet is constantly locked to its star because it's orbiting so close to its parent star, and the rest of the planet, uh, the planet would be covered with ice because it would be cold uh, and dark. Uh, completely dark on the back side of this planet. And so you would get this really warm hot spot on one side and this, these dramatic wind speeds whipping around the planet because you would have this huge day-night difference from one side of the planet to the other. And so you would see hundreds of, of uh, miles per hour winds constantly at the equator of this planet whipping around. But this, again, is models and speculation. The reason it's important to do is because we want to be prepared for future missions, but right now we're working, we really need to understand that, take this somewhat with a grain of salt, because uh, really what we're going to find with these telescopes will probably defy expectations to a, to a, a large extent. So um, let's skip this. So this is the range of missions that NASA is planning to, to, to study exoplanets in the next um, in the next few decades. We've, we already have the Hubble and Spitzer telescopes, and the Kepler telescope is the one I mentioned before, the Discovery telescope. We are about to launch the TESS and the James Webb telescopes. TESS will be a transit discovery mission to find all the transiting planets around nearby stars in preparation for studying them with the James Webb Space Telescope. And then these future telescopes, the WFIRST telescope and the New Worlds telescope, are meant to find these Earth-like planets and take pictures of them um, in the decades to come. The WFIRST telescope is expected to launch in 2025, and the New Worlds telescope is only in the early planning stages. It's expected to be the following decade, in the 2030s. And so maybe when you, know, you guys are already several, uh, a decade into your own careers, we'll be already talking about what we'll be discovering with the New Worlds telescope and what Earth like worlds may be, may be possible. I'm going to skip that. So uh, this, the fascinating thing about these telescopes is that they will be even bigger than the telescopes we have planned already. This is the Hubble Space Telescope um, right now, and it's the same size as the WFIRST telescope. But the Louvoir telescope here is the, uh, the plan, the largest architecture being studied for the New Worlds telescopes. It is more than twice or four times the area of these smaller telescopes and 10 times the area of the Hubble Space Telescope. So what we can do today with the James Webb Telescope to be launched in two years will be dwarfed completely by what we'll be able to do in the coming decades with the Louvoir um, Large Aperture Telescopes. And so hopefully what we can begin to discover are planets with surfaces full of water and atmospheres full of active clouds and circulating systems, and eventually discovering possibly the biosignatures and the signatures of biological activity that can start to give us a picture of what is going on on the surfaces and possibly the biological activity that's happening. So this is, this is currently science fiction, but it is actually on the drawing board for the next 10 to 20 years of NASA's uh, planned strategic vision. And we hope that with all of your help and with, the, you know, with a generous amount of, of luck and hard work by enge NASA engineers, we will, you will all enjoy uh, the fruits of our labors in the next couple decades. So thank you for listening, and I'll take a couple questions. Thank you.